Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. And this time, I actually have coffee in my cup, which is much better than having an empty mug. Okay. Uh, in keeping with the science fiction theme of today's uh, video, I have slipped the surly bonds of Earth and relocated us from being virtually in Greece to virtually above Greece. So that is still Greece there. Um, uh, Athens is roughly there. Uh, that's the uh, Isthmus of Corinth. That is the Peloponnese. Right there is the island of Ithera, where Leonard Cohen spent 10 years and I spent two glorious days. Um, over there is Istanbul and Anadolu Kavali, which is the entrance to the Black Sea. Um, so uh, uh, today I want to do something a little bit different, which is uh, I want to read something to you, which is not what I'm ordinarily going to do. But two years ago, I gave a presentation at the at a philosophy club meeting on philosophy and literature uh, at a local coffee house. See, the coffee theme continues. Uh, Mama Mocha is here in Auburn. And I've been planning to post the, uh, the text of my talk online, but I can't seem to find an electronic copy of the talk. Um, but I have a hard copy here. I haven't figured out both Zoom's successes and Zoom's failures at, at maintaining this background are interesting to me. But anyway, um, there's the thing. Um, and so I thought I'd uh, read it to you. It uh, deals with uh, both philosophy and science fiction, and it touches on. Um, uh, some themes that are going to be recurring in my discussion of both those topics. So, uh, the title of it is Philosophical Thought Experiments and Fantastic Fiction. And I explain a bit in a footnote that I'm going to use the term fantastic fiction to cover both science fiction and fantasy without worrying at present about the demarcation between them. One might suppose that science fiction differs from fantasy in being constrained by what is scientifically possible. But many science fiction writers who think that, for example, faster than light travel is scientifically impossible, nevertheless make use of it in their stories, and no one seems to suppose that this disqualifies such stories as science fiction. It's probably closer to the truth to say that science fiction has to present its fantastic scenarios as licensed, not by present day science, but by an imaginary version of science, presented as a development of or a successor to present day science. But uh, by that, uh, uh, anyway, I'm also inclined to think that even a writer who believes in the reality of magic or the supernatural, think of Arthur Conan Doyle, is still writing fantasy rather than science fiction, so long as the supernatural elements are not presented as being licensed by an imaginary extrapolation from present day science, though perhaps his book, The Land of Mist, is a borderline case. Okay. So, my paper. In the second book of the Republic, Plato introduces the story of Gyges, a shepherd who discovers a magic ring with the power to render him invisible. Uh, by the way, Gyges would have been somewhere around my finger, somewhere in that area in Sardis, Lydia. Uh, Gyges uses the ring to sneak secretly into the royal palace where he seduces the queen, kills the king, and seizes the throne of the kingdom of Lydia. Although Gyges of Lydia was an historical person, Plato presumably does not expect his audience to take this story literally. Less fantastic accounts of Gyges' rise to power are found in Herodotus and Nicholas Damascene. So why does Plato tell it? 
The point of the story is to pose a challenge to those who think that the only reasons to be moral are purely strategic. In other words, that the only reason I should behave cooperatively toward others is to gain a cooperative reputation, thus giving others an incentive to behave cooperatively toward me. Plato asks, would we still have reason to behave morally if we had Gyges' ring? And the, uh, thus could easily keep our wrongdoing secret, thus severing the tie between conduct and reputation. If Plato's opponent answers yes, then we should still behave morally, if we, that we should still behave morally even if we had Gyges' ring, then they must concede that the value of morality is not purely strategic. On the other hand, if they answer no, then they must concede that it is not morality, but only the appearance of morality that, the, that they are actually defending, and that a genuinely moral person must have different motivations from those they endorse. In his book, On Obligations, the Roman philosopher Cicero, who agrees with Plato's analysis here, records a response that some defenders of the strategic conception of morality had offered to Plato's thought experiment, namely that the counterfactual situation of the ring of Gyges is inadmissible since such a ring is impossible. Cicero has little patience with this reply. He insists that even if the ring of Gyges is impossible, it still makes sense to ask what it would be reasonable to do if the ring did exist. Debates over the admissibility of fantastic thought experiments and philosophical argumentation continue today, with some critics maintaining that our conclusions should be grounded in reality and not fantasy. Now, probably all philosophers can agree that when the counterfactual scenario is conceptually impossible, actually incoherent, it can legitimately be dismissed. We need not offer any answer to the person who asks, if two plus two were to equal five, what would three plus three equal? But when the counterfactual scenario is conceivable, most philosophers, not all, have traditionally regarded such a thought experiment as legitimate, even if it violates empirically established physical causal laws. Fantastic thought experiments are often used in ethics. Aristotle, for example, replies to those who think pleasure is the only worthwhile thing in human life by asking whether they would accept an offer to have their intellectual level reduced to the level of an infant in exchange for an enormous supply of infantile pleasures. If they answer no, that shows that they are committed to recognizing values other than pleasure. More recently, Judith Jarvis Thompson and Mary Ann Warren, in two of the best known philosophical articles on the morality of abortion, have proposed various bizarre science fiction scenarios with the following structure. If argument X against the permissibility of abortion were correct, it would also follow that in science fiction scenario Y, a certain action Z would likewise be impermissible. Yet it seems overwhelmingly plausible even to most proponents of anti-abortion argument X, that in science fiction scenario Y, action Z would in fact be permissible. Hence, argument X against abortion must be mistaken, even by its proponents' own standards, since it yields the wrong moral judgment about science fiction scenario Y. And I'll post a link to their articles uh, in the description, as well as uh, an article um, by my colleague, uh, Michael Watkins, uh, that uh, talks a bit about the, the logical structure of that kind of argument. When critics of Thompson and Warren object that their science fiction scenarios are far-fetched and implausible, their defenders reply, like Cicero two millennia ago, that since the thought experiments do not need to be realistic in order to perform their argumentative function, uh, pointing out that they are unrealistic is irrelevant. The philosophical use of fantastic thought experiments is by no means confined to ethics. The Greek philosopher Archytas, for example, uses a science fiction scenario to criticize the view that the universe is spatially finite. Suppose, he suggests, we could travel through outer space to the point where the universe supposedly ends, and we were then to attempt to thrust a spear past the alleged spatial limit. If the spear is impeded, then something must exist beyond the limit in order to block it. If the spear is not impeded, then again, there must exist something beyond the limit, namely empty space. Uh, and this next bit is not in the paper, but I just want to say a little bit of how I think uh, an Aristotelian would have responded. Um, and they could say, well, uh, 
if the spear doesn't keep going, um, then that doesn't mean there's something out there blocking it. It just means it's run out of space to move in. And if the spear does keep going, that doesn't mean that there was previously space out there for it to move into. It means that you have altered the shape and size of the universe. You've created a little spear-shaped point on the edge of it. At least that's what I suspect Aristotle would have said to Architas uh, had they uh, been able to join us uh, for coffee here on the International Space Station. That's where this photo is from, by the way. NASA, no copyright. More recently, Hilary Putnam has used a science fiction scenario to argue against the view that what our words refer, refer to is determined by an associated description in our minds. Putnam asks us to imagine a planet, twin Earth, which is exactly like our Earth. So for all you know, that might be twin Earth, not Earth back there. Uh, uh, exactly like our Earth, including the exact similarity of language, except that wherever there is H2O on our Earth, a superficially similar liquid with a different chemical composition, XYZ, exists on twin Earth. Before science had advanced far enough to detect the difference between H2O and XYZ, the mental descriptions the denizens of Earth and twin Earth associated with the word water might well have been identical. Yet plausibly, our water and their word water nevertheless already refer to different chemicals. This affinity with the genre of fantastic fiction runs through the entire history of philosophy, with countless thought experiments resembling short stories in the fantastic fiction genre. Descartes famously inquires what we could know if an all-powerful demon were constantly trying to deceive us, and less famously asks us to imagine looking out the window and wondering whether the coats and hats we see passing below cover human bodies or mechanical contrivances. Locke defends an account of personal identity via scenarios of souls switching bodies, and of the same body being inhabited successively by different souls, each inheriting the memories of the previous soul. Scotus inquires whether a mind that existed for only a single instant of time could make a free will choice during that instant. Hume imagines a human being created ex nihilo with fully developed cognitive powers and immediately confronted with a billiard table and asks what such a person would be able to predict about the causal interactions of billiard balls. Rousseau investigates what human society might look like if it arose from an initial situation in which all humans are solitary. Putnam asks whether a brain floating in a vat, having its neurons stimulated to simulate bodily experience, could coherently entertain the hypothesis that it is only a brain in a vat. Ibn Tufail asks what philosophical knowledge could be achieved by someone spontaneously generated on a desert island, growing up with no human interaction. Well, Ibn Sina goes in one better by asking the same question about someone raised in a sensory deprivation tank. Both give surprisingly optimistic answers. More recently, John Searle describes a person hidden in a room who follows rules for responding to Chinese language inputs with Chinese language outputs, despite not knowing any Chinese. While Ned Block describes an attempt to simulate a human brain by having the entire population of China network together so that each individual plays the role of a single neuron. Both of these examples uh, are descendants of Leibniz's thought experiment of entering a calculating machine as large as a mill and wondering when, whether it makes sense to think of it as conscious. Robert Nozick asks whether we would have any reason not to plug ourselves into a machine that could perfectly, perfectly simulate any possible experience. Well, Donald Davidson inquires whether an exact duplicate of you, Swamp Man, spontaneously formed by a freak accident with lightning and swamp water, would count as having your or any mental states. Frank Jackson tells the story of a neuroscientist raised in a black and white room and inquires what she would learn upon being released and experiencing redness for the first time. John Rawls asks, asks us to imagine what principles of justice we would choose if we suffered temporary amnesia about our values, characteristics, and place in society. Harry Frankfurt spins a tale about a scientist who has implanted a device in your brain and will activate it, compelling you to make a certain choice unless the scientist foresees that you will, still, you will make the same choice on your own. While these various examples do not all have the same structure, what they have in common is that in each case, what would be reasonable to say about some fantastic hypothetical case is taken as grounds for what we should actually say about real life cases. 
Indeed, it's a typical feature of philosophical analyses that they are supposed to apply to all conceivable cases, not just all actual ones or even all physically possible ones. Philosophy takes as its field the range of the conceivable, not the range of the actual. And of course, the same is true of fantastic fiction, more or less. I say more or less because there's no strict requirement that fantastic fiction scenarios be even conceptually possible. Isaac Asimov thought time travel was not just physically but conceptually impossible. Yet he wrote several perfectly good stories featuring time travel nonetheless, relying on what was from his point of view an illusion of conceivability. As Aristotle remarks in the Poetics, in fiction, a plausibly presented impossibility is preferable to an implausibly presented possibility. However, in most cases, the scenarios in fantastic fiction are at least conceptually possible, though sometimes they are not physically possible, at least according to present scientific understanding. While in other cases, they are physically possible in principle, but not achievable by any technology presently available to us. Given the similarity between philosophical thought experiments and fantastic fiction stories, how similar are they in their purposes? In some cases, the purposes do seem quite similar. Ursula Le Guin's short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, depicts an idyllic society whose near universal happiness depends on the misery of a single individual. The story seems to function very much like a thought experiment to undermine the utilitarian idea that the welfare of the many can justify the sacrifice of the few. Indeed, Le Guin borrowed the idea from a philosophical argument by William James, who in turn got it from Dostoevsky. Many dystopian stories function by picking some present day trend and extrapolating it forward to a nightmarish extreme. This describes such works as The Time Machine, Brave New World, 1984, Atlas Shrugged, Fahrenheit 451, Harrison Bergeron, The Handmaid's Tale, and The Hunger Games as well as, say, the depiction of Mordor and Isengard in Lord of the Rings. One way of reading such works is as a warning. This future is where we're headed if we don't nip these trends in the bud. But another way of reading them, not incompatible with the first, but distinct from it, is not so much as a prediction, as a way of showing that these trends are problematic already by presenting them in extreme form. The argument being not, these would be bad in extreme form, so they are also bad in moderate form. That would clearly be fallacious. But rather, showing these trends in their extreme forms reveals their essential nature in such a way as to condemn their moderate forms also. As with Plato's observation in the Republic, that moral phenomena written in small letters may be easier to discern if we see them written in large letters first. Another way that fantastic fiction stories can criticize present day institutions and practices is by divorcing them from their customary associations in order to make their problematic nature more visible. For example, Al Feldstein's classic 1953 comic book story, Judgment Day, depicts a human astronaut returning to check on the progress of a, Roman, of a robot colony, only to find to his bafflement that the orange robots are oppressing and marginalizing the blue robots, despite the fact that the two kinds of robots are essentially identical apart from their outer coverings. Clearly, the thought behind the story is that the irrationality of color prejudice will be more obvious to many in the robot case, since most readers have no pre-existing prejudices one way or other about the color of robots, and then can hopefully be extended to the, for some, initially less clear human case. Of course, not all fantastic fiction stories have morals as obvious and straightforward as Judgment Day or the ones who walk away from Omelas, and that's good. Since while heavy-handed moralizing can certainly be appropriate in many cases, one wouldn't want all literature to take that form. So for instance, the moral of Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed, is neither anarcho-communism is great, nor anarcho-communism is awful, though many readers do seem to come away with one or the other of those upshots. Rather, Le Guin presents her imagined society as having both attractive and unattractive features, and non-dogmatically invites the reader con to consider A, whether or how far the two aspects can be separated, and B, in cases where they can't be, how the trade-offs in such a society are to be compared with the trade-offs inherent in other types of society. An important philosophical function of fantastic fiction, and of course mainstream fiction as well, 
is to make philosophical ideas clearer by dramatizing them. Plato presents his dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, as sequels of a sort to his Republic. He has Socrates note that he has just finished describing the ideal state in theory, but complained that that which is beyond the range of a man's education he finds hard to carry out in action and still harder adequately to represent in language. Hence his feeling about the state which we have been describing is like that of a person who, when beholding beautiful animals, either created by the painter's art, or better still, alive but at rest, is seized with a desire of seeing them in motion, or engaged in some struggle or conflict to which their forms appear suited. Critias then obliges Socrates by beginning to relate a story about the ideal state, imagined as prehistoric Athens at war with Atlantis. One difference between philosophy and fantastic fiction is that a good philosophical thought experiment usually tries to address just one question, whereas a good story may have many different questions interwoven. A related difference is that philosophical thought experiments usually seek to be unambiguous, and this is not necessarily a requirement of fiction. For example, Franz Kafka's fantastic stories of people trapped in baffling mazes of nightmarish bureaucracy are sometimes read as a critique of modern bureaucratic civilization, uh, and sometimes read instead as a depiction of the human condition generally. On the latter interpretation, the elusive authority figure that the protagonists can never manage to meet face to face is God. But there's some evidence that Kafka intends both interpretations and seeks to have his stories function on both levels, even if the two readings seem to have different upshots. On the political reading, totalitarian bureaucracy is apparently condemned whereas on, on the theological reading, God is apparently not condemned. Needless to say, fantastic fiction need not have any philosophical aim. It can use its fantastic scenarios purely for entertainment value, and there's nothing wrong with that. But most fantastic fiction tends to be at least a bit more philosophical than that. For example, time travel stories often explore such questions as, what would tri time travel be like if it were possible to change the past? What would it be like if it weren't possible to change the past? And what would it be like if only the present were fully real? One might think the last option is not a possible form of time travel story, but Stephen King pulls it off in The Langoliers. The Langoliers does not make sense as a literal depiction of metaphysical presentism, but it works just fine as a metaphorical description of it, depiction of it. While philosophy and fantastic fiction do not have identical aims, their aims overlap often enough to make for an intriguing affinity. Okay, that's all I've got. I'd be interested to see your uh, comments below. Uh, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you next time.